Right, well, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, an expert in the field of allergy and immunology, and an alumnus of our own University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and formal faculty member, Dr. David Stukas. Dr. Stukas is an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in the Ohio State University College of Medicine. At his institution, he serves as the director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center and the associate director of the Pediatric Allergy and Immunology Fellowship Training Program. Dr. Stukas is a member of the Board of Regents for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He's the social media editor and the host of the podcast series for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And he is one of 12 invited members for the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters for Allergy and Immunology. Dr. Stukas has published two textbooks and over 60 peer-reviewed manuscripts. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at AllergyKidsDoc, where he's amassed over 30,000 followers. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and welcome, Dr. Stukas. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It, it's a real pleasure to be here. I really wish it could have been in person, but I completely understand, and, and hopefully we can make that happen in the near future. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. I'll rely on uh, Colleen and all of you to let me know if for some reason you can't see my, uh, my screen advance. Um, it was almost exactly 10 years ago that I last stood in Rango's auditorium and I received one of the greatest honors of my career where I was um, voted the William Cohen Teacher of the Year Award from the House staff and that's something that I will always cherish. Uh, so it was quite lovely and, and Pittsburgh is near and dear to my heart. That's where I'm from and I really enjoyed being faculty there and, and working with many of you on, on the call today. Um, it's my understanding that I'm, uh, you, many of you were bombarded by my face, uh, like everywhere for the last couple of weeks, and, <laughs> which is interesting, and I appreciate you tuning in today. Um, I don't know about billboards on Route 28 or anything like that, maybe that's for the next talk. But today's talk is titled Benadryl's Obsolete and Other Pet Peeves in the World of Allergy, but really that's just the attention-grabbing National Enquirer headline. The real talk is things I do differently now compared with five years ago. So it's not going to be me on my soapbox yelling at all of you uh, about things that are being done wrong in allergy. And we'll get into that. Here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to today's talk. And then here are our objectives. And we're just going to get right into it if it's okay. <clears throat> so I start with this. This graph represents the exponential increase in the sheer volume of peer reviewed manuscripts and publications over the last several decades. And I start with this only because it is impossible for any of us to keep up with the ever-changing landscape of evidence-based medicine. It is a losing situation. If you just look at two of the highest rated impact factor journals for our specialty in allergy and immunology, there were over a thousand articles published in 2020. Uh, I did not read all those articles and I doubt that any of my colleagues in Pittsburgh in allergy and immunology read them as well. So if you're in primary care or other specialties, how on earth can you keep up with all this stuff? It's virtually impossible. Uh, and that's, you know, what we're here today. And really, um, even when you do have clinical guidelines that are published, it can take years before they're actually translated into clinical practice. Um, and, you know, that's something that it, there's a lot that goes into it. There's inertia. We're just kind of used to doing things the way they've always been done. This is how I was taught. This is why I'm going to teach others the same way. There's just slow adoption of evidence-based medicine. There can be skepticism for new information, especially when it contradicts previously held beliefs. Time constraints that I mentioned is keeping up with it. We all have our own cognitive biases that interfere with really our ability to uh, perceive new information, our own anecdotal experiences. I saw a patient 20 years ago that had this and I treated them this way and they got better. Therefore, I'll treat everybody that way. Uh, and it's just overwhelming. So there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to keep up. So what we're going to do today is take a deeper dive into some of the, the more specific areas that have really evolved over the last few years of our specialty. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to check out the Choosing Wisely series. This was started by the American Board of Internal Medicine, and they partner with over 60 subspecialty organizations to develop sort of a, a who's who of things that are, uh, you know, should, should not be done uh, in, each, in each area of specialty. And in regards to allergy and immunology, there are actually 10 things that physicians and patients should question. We're going to cover five of them today. And number one on the list don't order unproven diagnostic tests such as IgG testing for the evaluation of food allergy or large batteries of IgE panels. We'll spend some time talking about that. Don't rely on antihistamines as first line treatment in severe allergic reactions. Don't perform IgE testing unless you have a history consistent with IgE mediated food allergy. Don't routinely do diagnostic testing in patients with chronic hives. And then don't overuse non-beta lactam antibiotics in patients who have a reported history of penicillin allergy. So that's gonna be the main focus. And as we begin, I just pose a simple question. So take a look at this chart. 
it's blinded. You have two choices here, medication A, medication B. We're gonna use them both to treat the same exact symptoms. Which would you choose? Medication A that has a longer onset of action, medication B that actually works a lot faster. Medication B lasts longer, it's more effective, has less side effects, and oh, by the way, only one of these is not allowed to be used by pilots for 30 hours before they get inside the cockpit to fly a plane. So which would you choose? I think most people listening right now would probably choose medication B, at least I hope so. Well, what we're discussing here are first generation antihistamines and second generation antihistamines. This is a great review article. By the way, feel free to take screenshots. I'm gonna give you some good references to look at on your own time if you like, but this review article really highlights the evolution of our understanding of antihistamine medications and histamine receptors. And diphenhydramine or first generation antihistamines, trade name of course is Benadryl, uh, title of the talk, has been around for 80 years. It's something we have all known. Uh, most parents out there have it readily available. We've been feeding it to babies like candy for decades. Second generation antihistamines have been around for 40 years. But oftentimes those first generation antihistamines are still preferred over those second generation because of familiarity. And I love this quote from this review. Most of these first generation antihistamines were introduced before regulatory agencies existed and before clinical pharmacology studies were required. In other words, I don't even know if Benadryl would get approved by the FDA if it went before them today. Let's think about that for a moment. Now, as far as how antihistamines work, they don't actually stop allergic reactions. They don't bind to histamine and histamine is one of the main chemicals that gets released. If you have inhalant allergies, the histamine gets released inside the upper respiratory tract, causes sneezing, itching, stuffy nose. Of course, histamine can cause hives and we'll talk about anaphylaxis in a moment. Antihistamines just shift the receptors. They go from the active to the inactive state. Therefore, histamine is still floating around, but it's not gonna cause those same symptoms whenever it tries to bind to those receptors. When we look at the first generation antihistamines, they're very non-selective in regards to what receptors they bind to. So they don't just target those histamine receptors, they actually bind to receptors throughout the body. And this is why we see such significant side effects or the potential for significant side effects with these first generation antihistamines. We can have um, you know, nervous system um, side effects, muscarinic receptors, and you can have increased dryness of the mucous membranes. It can affect serotonin receptors. It can even affect our heart rhythms as well. And we've seen more evidence over the last few years that show that use of first generation antihistamines in um, elderly patients is associated with dementia. Uh, so these are big problems to worry about. And then when you actually look at the evidence base supporting them, how many of us use first generation antihistamines for you know, a whole host of conditions, uh, let, you know, let alone to help people sleep at night or for analgesia or anxiety or pre-medication when we're giving transfusions and things like that. Well, there's very little evidence to actually support it for most of the things that we use them for. There's pretty good evidence that shows these, these older antihistamines work pretty well for allergic conditions, especially allergic rhinitis or hives. But if you look at this list and think about in your own specialty, your own field, how often are you using these first generation antihistamines and what does the evidence actually show? Uh, it often doesn't support it. Our uh, wonderful colleagues to the north uh, made some headlines a couple of years ago, and that's sort of what got me uh, started on my soapbox on this topic in the first place. Uh, and this all came about, this is one of the headlines to try to remove uh, Benadryl from uh, you know, being over the counter for anybody to get. And this is the reference that I put up here for any of you who are interested. They do a wonderful job in this um, paper, really walking through sort of what I introduced about all the different side effects with first generation antihistamines and how we basically just have much better options available. I'm not saying don't use any histamines. I'm just saying that we need to be thoughtful about why we're using them and what selection that we're going to use because second generation antihistamines are readily available. There are a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people think that first generation antihistamines like Benadryl just work faster and, and that's why we should always use them. Well, if you look at the actual data, they don't work faster. So second generation antihistamines like cetirizine and fexofenadine actually work faster. And then they last up to four times as long as well. So a lot of these misconceptions that we've been carrying around, we can get rid of. And in fact, in, in our division in allergy and immunology, we often now use second generation antihistamines, not only to treat allergic reactions in the office setting, but also as part of all of our food allergy um, and treatment plans that you know, children go to school with. And then this is one of my favorite studies of all time as we sort of wrap up our first topic here this morning. Uh, this was published 20 years ago. And what this was, was this was done in the University of Iowa in the driving simulation lab. So you have volunteers go in and they, they try to, you know, maintain their distance between the car in front of them, stay within the cones. Think about driving on, you know, the parkway during rush hour. And then they were randomized to four groups, placebo, uh, high doses of fexofenadine, uh, Benadryl, 50 milligrams. And then the other group did shots of vodka till they were legally drunk. 
this is the greatest study ever. Then they got back in the driving simulator and they, they tried to see what their performance was like. If you actually look at the results, those who actually took diphenhydramine were more impaired than those who were legally drunk. And even more scary than that, they weren't sleepy. So they didn't feel drowsy and they didn't know it. So really think about the effects of that. And if we're prescribing these first generation antihistamines like we, like we often do, or even take them ourselves, and then you're gonna get in a car and drive or operate heavy machinery, or you're a police officer, or you're in charge of having you know, handguns or things like that, this can be a real problem. And this is why the FAA does not allow pilots to take any first generation antihistamines for 30 hours before they fly an airplane. So think about that and think about this study, especially, and also think about this next time you're driving on the parkway and bumper to bumper traffic and watching those cars trying to stay in their lanes. Maybe they're taking Benadryl as well. So take home points. We have much better options available. Our understanding of uh, you know, proper use of antihistamines and indications for use has really evolved over the last few years. And really uh, there's very few of any indications to continue to use these first generation antihistamines. So hopefully that kind of wets your whistle for how we're gonna approach today. All right, we're gonna talk about anaphylaxis briefly because there are some new updated guidelines that were published last year. And this was a grade document. So what this did was it took very specific questions to look at uh, specifically biphasic anaphylaxis. We used to think biphasic anaphylaxis, which is essentially anaphylaxis that occurs, is treated or self-resolves, and then the symptoms come back again as part of the same reaction within four, six, eight, sometimes 24 hours, a really scary proposition. Well, it turns out that biphasic anaphylaxis likely only occurs less than 5% of the time. And we actually have ways of, of trying to risk stratify and identify those that are at risk for it. When we're talking about anaphylaxis, this is a rapidly progressive systemic allergic reaction that can involve any type of uh, any part of the body. So traditionally we say more than one body system. So you can have hives along with swelling, you can have upper respiratory symptoms like congestion or rhinorrhea, bronchospasm, especially if you already have underlying asthma or poorly controlled asthma, nausea and vomiting, it can affect the blood vessels. And as you see on the schematic, histamine is the main chemical that gets released very rapidly from the mast cells and basophils in the body that cause a lot of the symptoms, but there are other mediators as well but we focus on histamine because it really is the one that gets re released in these preformed granules and works very fast. I'm gonna focus just on one question here. So question two on the new grade parameters really focuses on should we be using antihistamines or steroids in the treatment of anaphylaxis specifically to prevent biphasic anaphylaxis? How many of you have had a knee jerk response when you're treating anaphylaxis or recommending treatment for it that in addition to epinephrine, we should give antihistamines and steroids? That's what we were taught 20, 30 years ago. And that often is, is what's perpetuated today in emergency rooms across the country. Sometimes these medications are used in place of epinephrine, which is much more effective. Well, if you look at the evidence to support it, it actually doesn't. Um, so this actually means that epinephrine really is the only first line treatment of anaphylaxis. It works fast. It treats all of the symptoms. It can actually help close up those allergy cells and prevent additional mediators from being released. It doesn't matter even if you use it for just total body hives, it works really, really well. How many of you used to have used epinephrine for somebody having an asthma exacerbation? It works great. Uh, so it can treat all those symptoms. And antihistamines and steroids don't actually prevent biphasic reactions. So if they're being used for that purpose, they're not gonna be very effective. But of course, if you have somebody that is having significant itching or, or hives and they would benefit from antihistamines, these parameters aren't saying don't use it, just be thoughtful about using it. However, steroids really do have a very limited role. Uh, so this is something that we've been working at our institution to help spread the word and, and increase awareness and education. And there are other institutions as well that have taken quality improvement approaches to really change their order sets and get rid of these knee-jerk responses of treating everybody who comes in with these medications. And finally, just keep calm and give epi. So if you think about giving epinephrine, you should give it. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about side effects and everybody thinks about pulp fiction and being stabbed in the heart. When we give epinephrine through the you know, predetermined doses and these auto injectors, it's very safe to give. It works very fast. It treats all of the symptoms and we can make people feel better uh, pretty rapidly if we can encourage use of this. All right, so I'm gonna credit my old colleague from Pittsburgh, Andy McGinnity. Uh, he presented this case uh, when I was working with him a decade ago, and I love it because it really highlights what we're gonna talk about next. So this is a six-year-old girl, and she comes in, uh, parents are worried about, she sneezes when she's around dogs, and every spring she gets typical rhinitis symptoms, and she coughs and has frequent upper respiratory infections. So her well-intentioned pediatrician ordered something called a childhood allergy profile. Uh, how many of you out there have ordered a childhood allergy profile before? Exactly. 
So what came back was this. Well, interestingly enough, she came in because of seasonal rhinitis symptoms. The only inhalant allergens that were included were indoor allergens. So it didn't even address the actual um, chief complaint in the first place. And then it came back with this long list of foods. And in addition to actually giving numbers for foods, it gave the big red scary exclamation point. And then the parents were notified and they said, oh my God, you need to stop feeding your daughter dairy and peanuts and egg and banana because she could die next time she eats it. Well, that's of course a very big problem. Now, for those of you who are scrolling uh, social media or on Facebook or anything like that, do me a favor, uh, look away for just a second and focus on this slide, because this is the most important slide that I'm gonna present to you this morning. Sensitization does not equal allergy. Sensitization is merely the detection of specific IgE towards an allergen, whether it be food, inhalant allergens, even venom, things like that. You can do it through skin prick testing, intradermal testing, or blood testing. Allergy is, I have a story of characteristic symptoms that occur in a reproducible manner every time I'm exposed to the allergen, and I have detectable IgE. If you look at large um, data, such as NHANES trial data from thousands of children, up to 40% of children are sensitized to milk, egg, peanut, or shrimp, but only 5% are actually allergic. If we rely on IgE testing alone, we are gonna overdiagnose and misdiagnose the vast majority of people with food allergy that don't actually have it. This is why it's number one on the list of, cho of the Choosing Wisely series. Okay, you can go back to social media now. Uh, so when it comes to IgE mediated food allergies, these reactions are objective. I need to look at somebody and say, you're having an allergic reaction. There's a lot of subjective symptoms that can occur or other, other symptoms that are unrelated to food allergy. It should happen pretty fast, usually within minutes of ingestion, rarely longer than two or three hours later. If you're seeing somebody with suspected food allergy, you don't need to take a dietary history of what they ate three days before. It's really what meal or snack did they eat just prior to those symptoms happening. Uh, it, it includes if they wake up in the morning with symptoms, that's unlikely to be food allergy. And it should happen every time you eat the food. If you're worried about a cow's milk allergy, they really should have symptoms every time they eat cheese, ice cream, yogurt, or when they drink milk, uh, which should help differentiate from a possible non-allergic milk intolerance. Typical hives can vary over time, or I'm sorry, typical symptoms can vary over time. Uh, oftentimes we'll have highs, but not always. Uh, not all food allergy reactions actually have skin manifestations. You can have swelling, vomiting, runny nose or congestion, wheezing, uh, and then anaphylaxis. So really it's the history, which is the best test. When we think about food allergy, we have to have sort of our risk stratification. There are eight foods that account for more than 90% of all food allergy reactions. This would be cow's milk, egg, wheat, soy, seafood, uh, including finfish and shellfish, tree nuts and peanut. Sesame is probably nine on the list. And you certainly can have allergies to other foods, but you have to prove it. So you have to prove that by saying, here's the story of what happens when I eat this food every time. And then we can consider testing and, and diagnosis and things like that. We can use our understanding of risk factors to help determine who's more likely to develop food allergies. When you have infants that have persistent, especially severe atopic dermatitis or eczema, they're raising their hands and they're saying, pay attention to me. I'm the one who's at risk to develop food allergies. And we'll talk about prevention in a few minutes. If they have underlying asthma or if they've already demonstrated that they have an allergic predisposition. Specific food allergies are not inherited. They're not passed down from parents or siblings, but the predisposition to develop allergies absolutely is. So allergic parents often will have allergic children. So we can use all of this uh, to help determine the proper diagnosis. Skin prick testing is readily available. It's something we do in the office setting all the time. Uh, we take a, a drop of liquid allergen. We will place it on the back or on the forearm. We'll gently scratch through the top layer of the, scale, the, the, the skin. rather. We'll introduce that allergen to those allergy cells. If that person has specific IgE bound to those mast cells in the skin, the allergen will unlock the IgE. It'll release histamine and it'll cause a hive. We come back 10, 15 minutes later, we look at the size of the hive to determine the likelihood of allergy being present. Very high negative predictive value, but tons of false positives. So again, we don't wanna do random food allergy testing even with skin testing. Then we have blood testing where we can measure levels of specific IgE in the blood to a whole range of allergens. These are widely marketed. I'm sure they're in your offices all the time saying, oh, you can just you know, screen your patients and see exactly what they're allergic to just by doing these tests. These are available for at-home testing now. Uh, which is a really scary proposition. And the results come in three ways. You'll get a range of numbers from 0.1 to 100 kilounits per liter. You'll get these arbitrary classes, class one, class two, class three, ignore them. They're completely made up. And if you look at it, there's no way that the same class designation would mean the same thing for different foods. Forget the classes, they don't mean anything. 
And then you get the big red scary exclamation point that says, oh my gosh, if your patient eats another bite of this, they could die. Ignore that as well. Anything that comes back above a certain threshold, they give you that as an alarm. The numbers mean different things for different foods. The numbers mean different things for different people. And just because you have a number doesn't mean you're actually allergic. Both of these tests have a high negative predictive value. Both of them have a low positive predictive value. Neither of them can predict severity of future reactions and neither of them are diagnostic in and of themselves for food allergy. We have to use the history to help guide the testing, but these tests generally have a pretty high correlation between them. There are some newer tests available, which I'm sure many of you have seen. These are component tests. So instead of just lumping the different antigens, say in peanut or a tree nut, all in one test, you can separate those out. And some of the antigens are more likely to cause clinical reaction as opposed to cross reactivity with aeroallergens. So the, big, the best example would be peanut. There's a lot of people out there that are sensitized to birch tree pollen. They get itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, runny nose in the spring. And if you do a peanut skin test or blood test, it may actually cross-react with that birch tree pollen allergy they have. They may not actually have a clinical allergy to peanut. I recommend caution in ordering these tests because the lab results will often tell you based upon the antigens that come back that this patient is at risk to having anaphylaxis. That's not the case at all. There are no established cutoff levels. Just because you have a number doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're allergic. Some of the antigens are more likely to, co to correlate with clinical reactivity, but again, it doesn't necessarily tell you how severe it is. So we just need to be thoughtful about the way that we use these tests as well. And there are newer tests being evolved. But ultimately, and one thing I think about myself all the time and what I teach to residents and medical students and fellows I work with, any test you order, I propose that all of you think about this. Should I order the test? Well, there's two questions. Do I have the knowledge and expertise to interpret the results? No, I probably shouldn't order that test. I stopped ordering ANAs a long, long time ago because my rheumatology colleagues kept yelling at me to say, Dave, stop ordering ANAs. And I said, you know what? You're right. I don't know how to interpret ANAs. I'll stop ordering them. All right. Do I know how to interpret? Yes. Will the results change the diagnosis and or management? We need to stop going on fishing expeditions. How many of us routinely order CBCs on patients admitted to the hospital? What do we do with the information? What are we, you know, and how often do those results come back slightly outside the reference range, which then, which then leads to repeating the results? And I would propose for anybody out there that um, is actually ordering food allergy testing, predict the results before you order it. I do this with families. I say, I'm glad you came in today. I appreciate you sharing your concerns. I don't believe your child has a food allergy based upon X, Y, and Z. I think that we can test to help provide reassurance. I'm predicting it will be negative. When it is negative, um, then it's very reassuring, and then we can go on our way or on, the vice, on vice versa. I'm glad you came in today. I'm concerned about food allergy here, the tests that I propose. I believe that they will be elevated and we can talk about management. So see if you can predict the, the results before you order the test. This slide here is a comprehensive list of every single clinical condition for which a food allergy panel uh, should be um, considered. Uh, this is not a typo. There is zero clinical indication to ever order a random assortment of different foods on a food allergy panel. There's no clinical indication for it whatsoever. Again, this is why it's number one on the choosing wisely list. It causes lots of overdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and big problems in people. One of the greatest achievements in my career was uh, convincing our laboratory to remove these panels from our lab. So uh, as of uh, 18 months ago, nobody can actually order these panels through our lab. You certainly can order specific IgEs towards different foods whenever you want. You just have to be thoughtful about which, which boxes you check. How did I achieve this? Well, we did a research study that we published in pediatrics that showed that these tests were being overused by non-allergists um, and that they were leading to overdiagnosis. And then we included the lab director as one of the co-authors. Uh, so consider that if you're ever considering similar approaches. Uh, take home points, both skin tests and blood tests have high false positive rates. There's a lot of people out there that aren't allergic that have sensitization or detectable IgE. Uh, shotgun testing is never indicated. And if you're doing IgE tests, there are non-IgE food allergies. Um, so eosinophilic esophagitis, or you can have um, milk protein induced proctocolitis and a whole host of things, but those aren't mediated by IgE. So IgE testing won't be very helpful. It doesn't mean they don't have a food allergy or need to avoid a food. They also don't help evaluate for food intolerances, but these IgE tests really only evaluate for that immediate hypersensitivity response. And lastly, these are not pregnancy tests. That's not a yes or a no. Uh, there's a range of results that you get, which must be interpreted according to the clinical story. All right, did I beat that horse enough? <laughs> Let's move on to rashes because there's a lot of confusion. There's, you know, part of the reason I love being an allergist is because there, many of the conditions we treat, not only are they common among children uh, and adults, but the symptoms that present often overlap with non-allergic conditions. So I love, love clarifying the diagnosis because that really changes management, understanding of risk, 
and need for avoidance. See, a lot of patients that get referred to us in allergy saying, go see the allergist, they're gonna tell you what food is causing their eczema. Well, I can tell you exactly what's causing your patient's eczema before they even walk in the door. You take a mother with a history of allergies, asthma, or eczema. You take a father with a history of allergies, asthma, or eczema. They have a romantic interlude. And then nine months later, you have a baby with eczema. So eczema is often an inherited condition. It is a chronic skin condition. It is not caused by allergy, but those who have severe persistent eczema are often at risk to develop allergies. We know that there are mutations associated with a lot of these uh, cases. It's a, uh, a defect in the skin barrier, basically, where the skin cells don't join very closely. And so all the moisture can escape. And as moisture escapes, that leads to dryness and irritation and scratching and redness and barriers work both ways. So that means that allergens and irritants can enter and make things worse as well, uh, which can cause lots of inflammation. There's an there's a interesting sort of history of allergies and eczema. A lot of the older textbooks and, and thoughts surrounding this were that, you know, you might be able to identify a food in the baby's diet or maternal diet that may be driving it. Well, it turns out the history is unreliable. This is not an IgE, as soon as I eat it, I get hives response. This is, and very rarely when this occurs, I'm eating a food and then it's causing severe persistent eczema. And the only way to tell is by complete and strict elimination of the food, then we should expect the eczema to improve. The problem is eczema naturally waxes and wanes. So if you actually take a food out of the diet at a period of time when eczema is actually improving, then we get a false, um, it's a correlation and we falsely assess causation with it. And then when the eczema flares again, ultimately, which it will do for a variety of reasons, then people say, oh my gosh, well, maybe I took milk out. Now I have to take egg out or peanut or wheat or things like that. So it's really tough to tease this out. And now we know, and we all took an oath as physicians to do no harm, we absolutely can cause very real harm if we do unnecessary food allergy testing in infants with eczema, especially those with severe eczema. And here's why. If you have a child with eczema who's not having immediate onset reproducible symptoms when they eat a food, a lot of them have elevated IgE at baseline. That's a, a cofactor of eczema, and then you can get elevated specific IgE. But if they're eating it without problems, they are tolerant. We now know, and I've seen this, it's tragic when I see it, you take the same child, you do the same testing and you tell them to avoid the food and then they try to eat it again months down the road, you can actually cause them to have an allergic reaction. So we want to maintain the state of tolerance first by not testing in the first place, or second, if you do get results, emphasizing to the family, it's really important that you keep feeding this food because they're sensitized and if they avoid it, then they can become allergic. As I mentioned before, the role of allergens in eczema, it's really uh, kind of an iffy proposition. I consider this only for infants. So it's not gonna be the six, seven, eight year old. It's gonna be those less than 12 months of age or 24 months of age with truly severe refractory eczema. You've thrown the book at them You're using high potency topical corticosteroids. You're convinced that the family's doing a great job with all their hydration. You've addressed environmental allergens and any other cofactors. But the number one reason why we have uncontrolled eczema is often just lacking a good daily skincare regimen. We wanna counsel families to avoid any fragrance products, even if they're all natural, if they smell good, because those can be irritants for the skin. We wanna prepare them for the chronic waxing waning nature of eczema and let them know that even when the skin looks good, we wanna apply a good moisturizer and a barrier ointment. Um, one thing I counsel families is if it comes out of a pump, uh, it's probably a lotion and it's water-based. It won't absorb into the skin very well. So we wanna get the greasy stuff out of the tub that you scoop up uh, and then lather, lather your baby every single day, your child. I want them to be so moisturized that if you go to pick them up when they're naked, that they slip through your hands. That's what we're going for. Uh, but that's really hard to do. And it can, be, it can be hard for a lot of families to achieve that. I mentioned before about antihistamines and we all have used antihistamines to help treat the severe itch and atopic dermatitis. I put this up here because Histamine is often not the cause of their itching. There are many factors here. Sometimes it gets into this very complicated uh, psychosocial behavioral pattern where they start itching. And I've seen a lot of, of children with a uh, history of eczema where they're fine while they're wearing clothes. As soon as you take their clothes off, they start scratching. It's sort of a learned behavior that they have. So uh, if we're using old generation antihistamines, first generation to help them sleep at night, then we're just drugging a lot of babies essentially. So there's lots of other approaches. Um, and I just wanna be thoughtful about how we use these antihistamines. Okay, uh, we opened a, a new food allergy center here three months ago, and I'm, I'm proud to serve as the director of it. I'm ready to rename it. I think we have uh, clearly established that we are the Allergic Contact Dermatitis Center of America, and here's why. Because um, I have seen almost every food you can possibly imagine, and it comes in with the same story. You have a young child or toddler, or your infant or toddler, I should say, they all look the same. 
blue eyes, blonde hair, strawberry blonde hair, fair skin, history of sensitive skin and rashes. And then they get redness on their chin and their cheeks when food touches their skin. This is a great review article. This is just a, a partial list of the foods that are known to cause non-allergic contact rashes. Strawberries are an unlikely cause of true food allergy, but it's a very common cause of rashes. Tomato-based products. I see ranch dressing once every six months. Any type of sauce, citrus fruit, cinnamon, banana, even sometimes peanut butter can cause contact rash, but then you eat it and you're just fine. That can be really hard to tease out. And, and as allergists, we love helping families figure that out. So consider this if you have a otherwise happy baby who gets lots of rashes on the face when food touches the skin, and it's an unlikely cause of allergies such as strawberries or tomatoes or things like that. We can often keep feeding that food and not have to worry about avoidance or epinephrine or things like that. Some families, because this happens on a regular basis, they actually put a barrier ointment on their baby before eating because they get real messy and it can prevent some of the contact with the skin. But it's reassurance, uh, it's anticipating these concerns and, and helping families with confidence as they feed their babies. All right, here's a patient that I saw a couple of years ago. This is a young boy who had frequent episodes of hives and the parents said, listen, every time he eats dairy, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tomato, strawberry, we took all these foods out of his diet. He keeps getting hives, what is going on? They saw an allergist, they lived a few hours away and they did uh, wide panel skin prick testing to foods. And the parents were told he has 20 food and environmental allergies. Listen, they were told this, they said, listen, anytime he gets hives more than just on his trunk, give epinephrine, uh, cause it could be a severe allergic reaction, he could die. So they gave him epinephrine as they were instructed to do seven times over two months. And they were referred to me, not because of concern for food allergy, because they thought they had the diagnosis down pat. They were worried about mastocytosis as you know the cause of this patient's uncontrollable hives and things like that. And when I saw them in the office, I took the history and took one look at them. I did one simple test. And what I found was they had something called dermatographism. Uh, dermatographism is quite common. It often runs in families, actually. This is a form of physical urticaria, where if you put pressure on the skin or scratch it, and the way we test in the office, we'll take a routine tongue blade, I'll break it in half, and I'll um, apply a relative amount of pressure and I'll draw an X on the forearm and then on the back. And then we wait a couple minutes. And oftentimes when this is present, you'll see uh, basically urticaria develop and you'll see the wheel in the middle and then you'll see the redness around there. So that's dermatographism. So that's what this child had. We lucked out. I did some serum testing to help figure out the food allergies. Thankfully, only a couple of them came back slightly elevated. We did a couple of in-office oral food challenges. And this patient who was told that they could die if the hive spread past their torso and they have 20 different food allergies, uh, they were able to keep everything in their diet and just learn what chronic urticaria was. So when you have these patients with chronic hives, frequent rashes, and you're trying to figure out food allergy versus who knows what, here are some clues. Here's what doesn't suggest I IgE food allergy. If there's a long list of suspected triggers, if the suspected triggers aren't you know, a common cause of allergy, you have to prove you're allergic. I did a, a food challenge when I worked in Pittsburgh um, where they came in, they said, I think I'm allergic to raspberries. I said, okay, that's really interesting. What happens? They said, well, I get a rash in hives. Um, I said, all right. And I think we had limited raspberry testing at the time. So we did an oral food challenge. And then within an hour, they were covered in hives. I said, I believe you now. Uh, so we have ways of figuring this out. If there's no identifiable trigger, delayed onset between exposure and symptoms, if they're able to tolerate in other forms, I don't know how this still happens, but once a year I'll see somebody worried about peanut allergy. I'll ask the simple question, what happens when they eat peanut butter? And they'll say they eat peanut butter every day. And they don't understand that peanut butter is the same as peanut. Um, so we have to ask these questions to help tease this out or if they have chronic urticaria. My Stukas rule of hives, the longer the list of suspected items grows, the less and less likely it is that they're actually allergic to each of these items. And then I ask one question, well, what do you think causes your child's hives? And oftentimes they'll look at me and they'll say, I don't know, you're the expert, you tell me. And I'll say, exactly. If you haven't figured it out by now as a parent, it's unlikely that your child has true food allergy. Very few parents are gonna to continue to feed their child that same food that's making them sick every time they eat it. So take home points, being thoughtful about our understanding of food allergies, especially as, as they relate to eczema and chronic urticaria. There's a lot of harm that can come from overuse of testing. I'm not saying don't test, I'm just saying be very thoughtful about how we test and what we test for and then what we do with the results. And then please, you know, consider your friendly neighborhood allergist who can help tease this out for you. And I have one request from everybody out there. If you do refer somebody to be seen by an allergist to uh, evaluate for eczema or chronic hives, it's very different expectations if you say, go see the allergist, they're gonna do a bunch of food allergy testing and tell you what the cause is. That's, a, that's setting us up for a very uh, poor experience during the visit because people are very upset when we either don't test or we can't tell them what's causing it. 
But instead, please say, oh, we would, I think it'd be helpful to go see an allergist because they really specialize in treating these sorts of chronic skin rashes. And they can have a conversation with you to discuss if and what type of allergy testing may be helpful. So that's my plea to you. Please consider that when you send the referral. But we love, 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 love seeing these patients. Um, speaking of food allergies, this isn't so new anymore. I really hope that everybody uh, you know, watching today is, has seen the new guidelines. These were published a few years ago. Uh, we now have a path where we wanna recommend uh, feeding babies foods. We used to say no milk till one, no eggs till two, no nuts or seafood till three. If you're pregnant or breastfeeding, don't eat anything at all because you're gonna kill your child and cause food allergy. That was all based on expert opinion not supported by evidence. We have very good evidence that now shows the earlier we introduce egg and peanut especially, but other foods as well. Uh, to infants once they've already started eating solid foods and demonstrating that they want to eat them and they can chew and swallow and then keeping them in the diet. That's the key. It's not just one little exposure. It's keep it in the diet consistently. Those are the current recommendations. That's our best path on a population level to try to reduce that increasing prevalence of food allergy. Uh, there's very little harm that comes from it. Uh, misconceptions surrounding uh, risk for reaction in infants are are broad. Uh, there's parents that you know go to the they drive to the, the parking lot in the emergency room the first time they feed their child peanut butter. Infants rarely have severe allergic reactions the first time they eat it. Uh, we can provide this reassurance. They often will get hives or vomiting. I don't get patients as an allergist because they die the first time they eat peanut butter. I get patients because they get a weird rash or they vomit, and then it sends a signal to the parent that oh something's not right here. Um, so we can counsel families and provide reassurance and, and help um, guide their way. As far as how they should do this, I, I've asked some of the uh, leading dietitians in the food allergy world about, you know, what do you tell parents? Like once at one new food every three days, four days, five days, and they don't agree with each other. And then I ask them, what is the evidence to support? And there is no evidence to support this. And I get it. It makes sense if you tell somebody like, oh, well, if something's going to happen, maybe one new food every three days or four days or five days, that way if something does happen, you can tease it out. But here's what I propose to you. If food allergies aren't going to occur in 95% of all children at baseline, why would we tell 100% of all families that, oh my gosh, your child may have a food allergy, so you have to be really, really careful when you feed the food. Uh, or you could say, you know what, odds are they're gonna be fine. You can always give a small amount and see what happens. If nothing happens, keep going from there or try multiple foods all at once. And then if something happens, we can go back and tease it out. So really we wanna let babies eat. We don't wanna rub food on the skin first. That's how kids get sensitized. We wanna expose the allergen to the immune system of the gut and let them eat it and keep it in the diet. And then encourage them to explore different tastes and textures. Uh, if we're successful in this, we can really create a, maybe a new generation of children that um, aren't subsidized on macaroni and cheese and chicken nuggets like my children are. Um, but you know, expand their palates and let them try new foods and textures and uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and things like that. And then we can anticipate these concerns and say, as you introduce these, if they have, have eczema, it's going to wax and wane. Their sleep will change naturally. Their poop absolutely will change, uh, and so on and so forth. I throw this in here only because our understanding of maternal diet is also evolving. And it turns out that very little food antigen passes through breast milk to the baby. So for all those children out there with a variety of allergic conditions, very few mothers actually need to avoid eating that food in their own diet unless they prove otherwise. So blanket recommendations to tell every mother out there who has an infant with food allergy, they need to stop eating that food in their diet um, really is, is outdated. This is a great review article. I put this on here, a thoughtful approach. Are there indications where they may need to take it out? Absolutely. And those indications would be they keep eating the food and you're having the same symptoms in the baby while they're breastfeeding. Are there uh, multiple indications where it's, it's not necessary? Absolutely as well. And for those of you who have met the, those mothers that are in tears in the office, either thinking that they caused their child's food allergy to begin with, or you know they've taken 20 foods out of their diet and they're losing weight and they're stressed and they can't sleep at night and their, their child still has eczema, uh, we can prevent a lot of that and we can provide reassurance. And oh, by the way, while I think of it, if any of you out there uh, tell a mother that they caused their child to develop a food allergy because of something they ate when they were pregnant or breastfeeding, there's a little alarm that goes off in my office and I will know about it and then uh, I'll be in contact with you. Please don't tell that to mothers because it's not true in the first place. Their diet doesn't cause food allergy. Even if it were true, why would we say that to them? They have enough guilt anyway. So we need to try to remove that and anticipate that guilt as well as we help them on their journey. Okay, I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about food sensitivity and then we'll go to our last topic. This has been on the rise um, over the last few years. And I'm sure you've all seen the emails and you see the kits at your pharmacy and, and Target and Walmart and things like that. So food sensitivity, there is no consensus definition. When you look at the ICD-10 classification system for various diagnoses, 
Um, there are a um, hundred thousand diagnoses out there. I mean, there's, you know, I got a person got sucked into a wing, uh, an engine on an airplane, right side uh, intentional. And that's how specific it is. There is no ICD-10 code for food sensitivity. There's also no medical uh, definition of it. There's no agreed upon, you know, what this is what food sensitivity is, but that has not prevented people from uh, promoting unvalidated testing or marketing or their services and things like that. And what they're taking advantage of are the very common questions that parents and people have of, there's gotta be something wrong here. I just know it. My child's not acting right. I don't feel right when I eat certain foods. I have bloating, constipation. There's, there's gotta be something out there. And they tap into that. And what happens is people will go online for information. I encourage all of you out there, think of the common questions that you get on a regular basis, whatever specialty you're in or primary care, what are those questions? Type them into a common search engine, see what comes up. Then type the same question or topic into PubMed and see what the evidence actually shows. And if you think like a patient, you will have that insight as to why they have these concerns and why the internet can really um, impact their medical decision-making. Snake oil has been sold for thousands of years, hundreds of years, I don't know. Um, but snake oil basically are people taking advantage of uh, the, the, the questions that don't have answers. There's a lot of chronic health conditions that have no known cause and no known cure. And this is where snake oil comes into play. And that's what's going on right now in the food sensitivity world. These are just a couple of examples. If you just go online, five signs of hidden food sensitivity, sabotaging your health. 23 signs of hidden food intolerance, tracking down hidden food allergies. There are no hidden food allergies that I already talked about. If you're eating a food without problems, you're not allergic to that food. But this is the scary stuff that's out there. And then this leads people to seek testing. And if you look at these tactics, they've been used for years. So you, you cast a wide net and you say, food sensitivity may cause skin symptoms. What does that even mean? Have you ever felt bloated? Have you ever had a poor night's sleep? Have you ever had a hard time thinking of a word? Well, maybe you have brain fog and maybe you have a food sensitivity. So who's been using this for years? Psychics and fortune tellers. Ah, thank you for coming in today. I'm hearing from beyond. Did you know somebody named Bill? I didn't know anybody named Bill, but my grandfather's name was Bob. Yes, Bob. That's what I meant. Exactly. He's reaching out to you. So this is what's happening online. We can anticipate this. We can talk to families and we cannot order these unproven tests. Wonderful review review article written by John Kelso that really walks through how these tests that are being used, IgG blood testing is a test for tolerance, not sensitivity. It actually is a memory antibody. It just shows what somebody's eaten in the past. There's applied kinesiology or muscle testing being done. There's hair analysis, urine analysis, um, all kinds of made up things that are being done to diagnose this diagnosis that may not even exist in the first place. So just recommend caution with that, anticipate these concerns. And then I always try to give an answer to people. Um, so yes, I, I'm glad you're here. I hear you that your child's having symptoms and we go through, is it intolerance or allergy or who knows what else? And then ultimately, sometimes it's just a normal part of being a human. If you eat a lot of fiber, you're going to fart a lot. That's a byproduct of the fiber. It's hard for humans to digest it. Um, so thinking about the overall diet and reassuring families of saying, listen, I know you're concerned about your baby's poop. I had a family there measuring the size of their poop. Why would you do that? It's okay. Every child has different poop. It's, it's, you don't need to worry about the color or the smell or the consistency or the frequency or whatever it may be. So reassurance is often a very helpful tool as well. Okay, last topic for this morning. This is my favorite statistic in all of medicine. 10% of the general population will raise their hand and say, I have a penicillin allergy. But more than 95% of those same, same people aren't actually allergic. This is a big problem. And our understanding of this has absolutely evolved over the last few years. This is a great review article published in the New England Journal of Medicine that walks through um, why this is a huge problem. So if you have a penicillin allergy on your medical record, especially as a child, it stays with you for life. Uh, very few people take it off. And what that leads to is it leads to use of broad spectrum antibiotics, increased risk for antibiotic resistance, increased cost, increased length, length of hospital stay. It's a really big problem. There are some simple steps we can take to determine allergy versus side effects. Most of these labels are placed inappropriately by us as medical professionals. We use the clinical history to help tease us out. What was the timing of onset of symptoms? What were the symptoms that occurred? What was the duration of symptoms? Most importantly, have you received it again? Because if you have a true allergy, every time you're exposed to the antigen, you should have the same symptoms. So if you're concerned about penicillin allergy, but they just got augmentin uh, without any problems, they're not allergic to it. We can use detailed history to help tease this out a little bit. So have you received it again? If so, what happened? No clear recollection of symptoms. They probably didn't have anaphylaxis if they can't recall being rushed to the emergency room or getting epinephrine. 
Delayed onset rashes are very common, especially in children receiving antibiotics. Very few of these are actually immunologic rashes. Some of them are, but we'll talk about in a second what, how we can tease that out. Even for those who have a true allergy, especially IgE allergy, it often wanes over time. So if they haven't received it in a decade, they may no longer be allergic. Penicillin allergy is not inherited, period, hard stop. If they're avoiding it in the child because they report having a penicillin allergy, that's not a concern. And oh, by the way, that parent probably isn't allergic in the first place as well. Side effects are common, we can tease this out, or false assumption about cross-reactivity. So what can you do? It's making it a part of the culture. And this really takes consistent effort. Every patient that gets roomed, every time they report having an allergy, what are the symptoms? How do we classify that? Is it a true allergy? Is it a side effect? Then you have to address it with them. So it takes a lot of work, but if you can change the culture and address this consistently, you can make a difference. When it comes to cross-reactivity, even if they are allergic or if we can't tease out if they are or not, we can, under, we can update our understanding of how cross-reactivity occurs. It's really not from the beta-lactam ring, it's from oftentimes from the side chains that are, are, are similar between these medications. And when it comes to rates of cross-reactivity, when it comes to first-generation cephalosporins and penicillin, it's less than 5%. I know many of us were taught 10% or even higher. It's less than that. It's really pretty infrequent. Second, third, fourth generation, there's no cross-reactivity. So we can give that without any concerns whatsoever, even if we can't clarify their penicillin allergy. Same thing with carbapenems and S-treonam as well. So we can use this understanding to, to not unnecessarily limit the availability of antibiotics for that patient. Skin testing is readily available. It's very reliable, especially when it's negative. It has a very high negative predictive value, pretty low cost as well. So if you're concerned about that immediate onset allergy or anaphylaxis, skin testing can help rule that out. And then we use uh, graded dose challenges all the time now. Uh, our understanding has really evolved and the vast majority of children with delayed onset rashes can get it again. We just have them eat it in the office. We give 10% of the normal dose, wait 20 or 30 minutes to make sure nothing weird happens, give them the rest, and then we at least clarify they're not at risk to having anaphylaxis. Then if you look at this, this is a nice review looking at all the different studies that have looked at adults and children with delayed onset macular papular rashes from amoxicillin. You give it to them again, 95% of them have nothing. The less than 5% that have symptoms is the delayed onset rash. It doesn't cross over, so it doesn't cause anaphylaxis. So for the most part, we can often just give it again without any concern, or if that weird rash does occur on day five, six, seven, eight, then okay, we talk about, well, I still think this is a good antibiotic for you. We can, measure, we can manage any symptoms supportively. At our institution, there are 13,000 individuals that all have the capability of placing a penicillin or medication allergy on somebody's medical record. 13,000, it is impossible to try to educate all of those different individuals, but any one of them can just place it on the medical record and it stays on there forever. That's a huge problem. So who's allowed to remove a list of drug allergy from a challenge? Well, guess what? All of us are. We're allowed to take it off the chart. I know it seems nerve wracking and everybody's scared about it. We have nine full-time faculty in our division of pediatric allergy and immunology and three nurse practitioners. I can say that not all 12 of us are comfortable taking it off the chart. That's a huge problem as well. But if it doesn't belong on there, if we go through this, or especially if they've undergone the challenge and they've done fine, take it off the chart. That's the important next step. And then communicate that to the family. Your child is not allergic to penicillin. You don't need to keep reporting that every time they go in. I propose permanent tattoos, but that was frowned upon. Uh, you can see these signs when you walk around our institution, uh, we, you know, just letting families know as they wait for the elevator that, hey, by the way, are you avoiding penicillin? Maybe they're not actually allergic in the first place. And then penicillin PEAT uh, permeates our inpatient unit. So we have these questions that uh, it will go through and is a low risk for penicillin allergy by the intake questions that fires off a best practice alert and says, hey, your patient may not actually be allergic. Do you actually want to do a dose graded challenge while they're here in the hospital or refer for outpatient evaluation? So take home points, the vast majority of these suspected allergies aren't real. Inappropriate labeling can lead to lifelong unnecessary avoidance. And then really our understanding has evolved. So that was sort of a, a rapid fire whirlwind tour of a variety of different updated areas in regards to allergy and immunology. I think that we can all try to stay as up to date as possible um, and just question sort of why do we do what we do on a regular basis and take advantage of you know, being in a large academic referral center when you have allergists that can help out. Uh, that's what we're here for and we love to help and that would go for any specialty as well. And um, as we wrap up here, I'm happy to take questions. We talked before, I, I know the questions can bleed over. If it's okay with all of you, I just wanna take a couple of minutes and do a rapid fire myth busting because um, this, this, this is kind of fun. So if you'll bear with me, I promise I'll leave time for questions. I'm not going anywhere. So if you're up for it, let's go through just a couple of common areas of misconceptions. Okay, let's see what we can do. Hypoallergenic dogs do not exist. There, I said it, it's true. 
And here's why. So dog dander that causes allergy comes from saliva, skin, and urine. It has nothing to do with the length of the hair, or the shedding. Hypoallergenic dogs were created by marketers trying to sell dogs. If you believe in hypoallergenic dogs, then I have some unicorns that I would like to sell to you. Now, interestingly enough, some people with dog allergy may only have symptoms around certain breeds, but not others. So it may sort of uh, you know, lead to this myth perpetuating. Uh, the only way to tease that out is through exposure, but there is no such thing as a hypoallergenic dog, even if they're cute like this one. Drinking milk and eating dairy products does not cause mucus production. This is a great review article. Oftentimes what happens is when people already have pre-existing nasal congestion, post-nasal drip, and they drink milk, which is a viscous liquid, it makes them feel like they have more phlegm. But the dairy product itself does not actually cause increased mucus production. Sugar does not cause hyperactivity. Oh my gosh, what is going on right now? What is happening at the end of this talk? So this goes back to the 70s with the Feingold diet where uh, there's a physician in California who was saying that artificial preservatives and everything was causing quote unquote hyperkinesis in children, which is now defined as ADHD. And he did some, um, some poorly conducted studies. Those studies have not been able to be replicated. And oftentimes you say, well, what happened? Well, why do kids get so hyperactive when they're eating sugar? Well, if you think about the situations when they're typically eating these things, they're hyperactive because they're being overstimulated. They're at a birthday party. They're having a great time. They're running around, they're carrying on. It's not because they ate the frosting on the cake that actually caused them to be hyperactive. Our kids generally eat dessert, uh, you know, within an hour or so of going to bed. You can judge me if you want. They're not up all night bouncing off the beds. Uh, so this is a common misconception as well. Eating local honey or organic honey doesn't treat allergies. Uh, it's pretty basic. The honey, the pollen that bees collect is not from the windborne plants that cause allergy symptoms. That comes from trees and grasses. They collect pollen from flowers, which is relatively heavy. Um, so that doesn't even contain the right pollen in the first place. And eating pollen wouldn't desensitize you if you have allergies. If you have allergies to the pollen that you're actually eating, you're going to have an allergic reaction. You're not going to have a desensitization and feel better. Uh, this is common, a common misconception. Anytime you go to a farmer's market, keep your eye out for this. I guarantee you, you're going to see some claim about eating their local honey to treat allergies. And then I think this is the last one, radio contrast media, iodine, and seafood allergies. There is no indication whatsoever to ever ask a patient if they have a shellfish allergy prior to ordering a CT scan with contrast. This started 40 years ago from a self-report. It was a survey um, of a couple hundred people and they said, have you ever had a reaction to contrast media? Yes, I have. Do you have food allergy? Yes, I do. What are you allergic to? I'm allergic to shrimp. Well, the same percentage of people also said I'm allergic to chocolate, I'm allergic to milk and eggs. How many of you ever asked them if they actually have a chocolate allergy before you get a CT scan? Exactly. And then it, it actually got perpetuated by physicians. They said, well, this is interesting. There must be a link here. Ah, there must be iodine. Well, here's the deal. Iodine doesn't actually cause allergy. We all have iodine in our bodies. We eat iodine on a regular basis. It's literally too small to open up the allergy cells. It's not iodine. People with shellfish allergy react to the muscle protein called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is not present in radio contrast media. This is a huge myth. And yet still major academic centers across the country are asking patients and changing the diagnostic test they order based upon a self-report of shellfish allergy. All right, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks for bearing with me with the, the rapid fire myth busting and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you all for being here today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stukas, for that incredible talk. Honestly, highlighting clinical dilemmas I think that we face every day um, in our practice of pediatric medicine. Um, we do have a lot of really good questions in the chat. Um, and so I'm gonna start going through some of those. But Dr. Ben Miller actually um, wanted to say, welcome back. Um, he said, great talk. You mentioned not being able to use steroids and antihistamines as routine prophylaxis for a biphasic anaphylactic reaction. Do you recommend anything routinely for prophylaxis, prophylaxis of, an, of a biphasic reaction? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Ben. Great question. So for patients who uh, are at risk to have biphasic anaphylaxis, we'll generally have um, more severe initial presentation. So if they require more than one dose of epinephrine, if they require um, volume resuscitation due to hypovolemic shock, um, or if they require, if they have severe respiratory symptoms, those are the ones that should require a little bit longer monitoring. And that's when I would consider um, just, you know, watching them. But really epinephrine is the treatment. If symptoms come back again, you give epinephrine again. Um, I know that that goes against years of, of advice, but if you think about the mechanism of action for um, corticosteroids, they just take too long to work anyways. Uh, so for most people, their anaphylaxis is just self-resolved by the time the steroids would have any benefit. Mm -hmm. There you another question too. Um, if Which IV antihistamine do you recommend in place of Benadryl in severe reactions if you're going to use one? So um, if you're having severe reactions and you're going to use, well, of course, if you're having a severe reaction that's due to allergy or anaphylaxis, epinephrine. Uh, if you're not sure what to use, give epinephrine. 
Um, if you think about giving epinephrine, give epinephrine. <laughs> so by the time you even think about, you know, IV and medication, things like that, certainly if that's what's available, um, I know IV cetirizine is becoming more widely available. If that's all you have, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just suggesting let's be very thoughtful about how we're using these medications, which are being used for millions of people for a whole variety of indications that they're not um, really warranted for use. And then another question as well. Have you transitioned to low dose ICS for motorol as a reliever instead of albuterol as a reliever in your clinical practice? Yeah, I thought about including that. So if you look at the new US um, asthma guidelines that were published last November, they finally included what's been done in Europe and Canada for years of use of um, low dose inhaled corticosteroids with formoterol. So the formoterol matters. Salmeterol uh, is what's present in Advair. Formoterol would be in uh, Dulera or Simbicort. Formoterol has an onset of action similar to albuterol. And there's really good evidence that shows, especially if you have more intermittent asthma, that on-demand use of these ICS formoterol components can relieve symptoms and give you a nice dose of anti-inflammatory medication as well. Um, so being thoughtful about use, but I would encourage anybody to read. There's a great dissection of all of this in the 2020 NHLBI asthma guidelines. And another really good question from Dr. Radovic saying, my question is, can you please come back? This is amazing and hilarious as usual. I thank you so much. I, I, I would love to visit. I miss Permanis um, and so much else. <laughs> Another question we have in the chat is how likely is a history of erythema multiforme to represent a true penicillin allergy? Yeah, it's interesting. It's really hard to diagnose, uh, especially in the moment. Um, I love seeing them after the fact because I, we get to evaluate what happens afterwards. Um, erythema multiforme often will have that characteristic appearance, but it can look like all kinds of things. So it's gonna be more delayed onset. Um, Sometimes we're stuck and we just have to say, you know what, avoid it. But if push comes to shove and you need that antibiotic because it's the best one for you, we can deal with those symptoms because those aren't going to be life-threatening for the most part. Um, so should that occur? But also I undiagnose it in patients who actually have chronic urticaria and they just happen to have hives while they were sick. And then it seemed like erythema multiforme because it was a severe case of hives, but then they've avoided that medication. They continue to get those skin symptoms down the road. So it's always helpful to follow up and get a formal evaluation. We can also clarify which antibiotics they can receive as well. Thank you. And our chair, Dr. Dermody, wanted to say thank you for the outstanding presentation. Um, it appears that the incidence of allergies is increasing. Is this real or does it reflect overdiagnosis? And if real, what accounts for this increase? Oh boy, that's a great question. Uh, we believe it is real. Uh, it's, it's, it's being more widely recognized and we have better testing, but um, the prevailing theory goes along with the hygiene hypothesis, which has been shown on different continents throughout the world. And what this shows is that infants who grow up in farming environments where they're exposed to endotoxin and animals, and more specifically the poop from animals, and when animals eat their poop and then lick the baby's face, I know it's gross, but that's what helps. They're exposed to a wide plethora of different um, microbiota, which really impacts their microbiome. We know there's associations of differences in the microbiome in, in children who have allergies with those who do not, but we don't know what to do with that just yet. So how to manipulate that, that's the next step, but it's just now being identified. So we think that as we become a more cleaner environment, more urban living, and then the sanitizer everywhere and, and things like that, that that's probably contributing a little bit. So you have the genetic predisposition from parents, these environmental factors, and that's probably what's contributing to it. Another great study is, um, uh, babies who have pacifiers or binkies and they fall out of their mouth, parents who cleaned their baby's pacifier by putting it in their mouth as opposed to washing it and then pop it back in their baby, those babies had less incidence of eczema compared to those who had cleaner pacifiers. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. We, we want to let our babies get dirty. <laughs> and then one more question, I think, before we transition into um, just the meet and greet um, afterwards. I know we still have a lot of great questions rolling in. Um, but we have one that says, thank you. This was the best grand rounds. You verbalized so much of what I go through with patients and misconceptions. And the question being, the internet is a strong force. How successful are you with demystifying their research? Do you have tips for us? Uh, listen, validate, listen. Um, try to provide um, some sort of explanation for their concerns. Uh, recognize the void that the internet is recognize how we're all being manipulated by the social media algorithms that these are trains that are off the tracks, learn about it. Um, and then I, I've gotten great value from learning about cognitive biases. I do a lot of reading on this because it impacts all of us. It impacts my thinking, but all of our patients. And then you, you recognize it, you see it. You say, ah, I see what's going on here. And I see why you're, you read that newspaper article um, that is now impacting your life. What happened if you never read the article? 
Uh, so we do a lot of that conversation and then cognitive be behavioral therapy when they're uh, extremely anxious and it's impacting their quality of life. So no easy answer. Um, I just encourage anybody who's interested just to learn more about these topics because it's very complex and I've spent years working on these things and I don't, I, if I, I don't have it figured out. Um, sometimes you can meet, you can reach them. Uh, sometimes you can't, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Stukas. Um, again, we're going to transition into the meet and greet portion. So for everyone who is in the webinar, if you guys just want to click on that link um, in the chat, um, it'll actually transfer everyone over. But thank you again. All right. Thanks all. See you on the other side.